Hi, everyone. Welcome to the Suffolk Legal Innovation and Technology Lab's first, first Wednesday workshop for the Document Assembly Line community. Our idea is to make experts available for Q&A workshops on the first Wednesday of each month. Today's topic is DocAssemble Server Administration and Maintenance, and the Lit Lab's co-director, Quentin Stainhouse, is our first expert. I'll let him introduce himself in a minute. The workshop is being recorded, and we will share it on our YouTube channel when we're done. To find it, just search for Suffolk Lit Lab on YouTube. We've gathered questions from the community from the community in the document assembly lines Microsoft Teams forum. And you can also use the Q&A feature in Zoom to ask your questions during the workshop. Chat is enabled, but please use the Q&A for questions so they don't get lost in the chat. Guest video is disabled, but since it often helps to share your screen to demonstrate a problem, you can do that. Just please wait until we invite you to. Before we dive in, if you're hearing about the Lit Lab or the document assembly line for the first time, head over to suffolklitlab.org to learn more. Everyone who uses the document assembly line or the DocAssemble tools is welcome to attend our weekly community check-ins, join our community forum on Microsoft Teams, and attend our first Wednesday workshops. If you'd like to join us, email us at litlab at suffolk.edu. So let's get started. Quentin, go ahead and introduce yourself. And since you have the list of questions, you can take it from there. All right. Hi, everybody. I feel a little silly introducing myself, but I guess this is more for YouTube. I think everyone here on this call knows me, but I'm, I'm Quentin Stainhouse. I'm the co-director of the Legal Innovation and Technology Lab at Suffolk. I also own a consulting business, mostly built around DocAssemble work. And I've been working with DocAssemble for the last six years. Excited to answer some of the questions we got in advance, as well as any questions that come up live for you about DocAssemble today. And specifically, the topic of today's session is server administration. Um, I'm seeing a lot of, of the questions that came in advance being about reading logs, understanding how and when to do security updates. And we got a little bit in the weeds. I see not everybody who asked questions in advance is here on the call. So I'll prioritize the ones that are live that people have where we can clarify and tease out a little bit of more information about the question. So I'll show you the list I'm working with. I don't think there's any secrets there. Got lots of questions here, as I said. And I'm going to jump to this one here. What The question was, what should I be doing when I see a message from PIP? And how do I read and process that kind of message? That's the way I'm going to summarize this. So let's see if we can talk a little, see a little bit more about what that means and what we're, we're talking about here. I'm going to go to our dev server. I see in that question, the person was checking out what happens when they upgrade the GitHub feedback form in particular. That's a package we built at Suffolk. And let's just see, how do you read and understand those installation messages from, Git, from DocAssemble? It's a lot of data and information in them. Almost all of that data and information, I'm going to tell you, is irrelevant. You don't need to know or remember most of it. The main thing that I, I look at is whether it comes back as being green or not. I'm assuming this one is going to come back green and we're going to be able to read it and everything is going to look good. But the pip command, that's Python's package installer, is really wordy and verbose. So it's going to give you a lot of debug information about the exact process it's going through when it does the installation. And let's, we'll see an example of that in a second once this one finishes updating. Um, and I think everyone can unmute, right, Sam? So uh, Emily, I saw you were on the call. Does that sound about right for what how I'm describing your question? Um, thanks. Um, yeah, basically, I, I've, I kind of assumed that I could ignore it as long as it was green. But I think recently I've just started noticing that 
that like first message in that in that image where it says something about like how pillow is not updating and i think mm -hmm. it seemed like maybe that was new and so i wasn't sure if that was something i should pay attention to and that just led me to kind of a broader question about how much i should be paying attention to it in general okay yeah, so this top line information is going to be the most important to see here what forms were were changed by the installation. I'm assuming here, when we look at this, we know we tried to install a GitHub feedback form to update the version of that. And it seems that it impacted two other packages, assembly line and interpreter notice. And I'm assuming that's because in one way or the other, these two packages are expecting a particular version of GitHub feedback form, or possibly GitHub feedback form is looking for a particular version of these two. Usually the way we write that is a greater than or equal to sign. So if you update one thing, it might upgrade extra packages on its way if it needs a higher version of one of those packages. And that's what happens in DocAssemble when you push a package to GitHub it automatically updates the minimum version of the dependencies to the current version that's installed on your server. That usually is, is fine. It's good, I think, to test and expect that you're using the latest version of something. Just make sure that you do test it and um, it doesn't have any unexpected impacts to upgrade one of those packages. It only happens when you pin it as a dependency. So as you noticed here, it says it's not upgrading Pillow. And specifically, docassemble.webapp has some logic in it to pin its system dependencies so that those never get upgraded by another package you install. That's a built-in thing docassemble does to kind of keep you safe from accidentally upgrading dependencies. And maybe we can see here in this log if it has anything more about why it thought it might have to upgrade that. Most of this is just saying what files it installs where. It might tell us a little bit more about Pillow. It uh, looks like that's literally the only mention. Um, it's kind of unclear. Is that something is is maybe expecting a newer version of it? With pip, sometimes it's going to be something else that was already installed that you weren't even trying to touch that might change a version. Um, but just to like go a little deeper in here, let's see. Do a full screen share. What are we even talking about when we, we look at this stuff here? Um, Okay, sorry. I'm just trying to figure out where is the requirements text for this. Okay, it's not. It's just a setup.py. This file here should list the dependencies. Or there might be a requirements that text somewhere. But maybe I'll show you one that is a literally a requirements text so you can see, or a setup pi from a regular docassemble package instead of this more specific one. It's this list of installation requirements here. This sets the dependencies. And you can see here, like some of the packages, most of them at the time we're just saying it has to be greater than or equal to something else. I don't think I have the, the feedback form located, look, 
look over here. I do not. We can look at it online and see if it's for some reason does have that a specific version that it expects to get for any of those, like for example, for the pillow package. It'd be a little surprising, but it's possible. Oh, it's a little bit more familiar anyway than the editor I was using on the command line. No, it only seems to require AL toolbox. And actually relatively old version is the minimum. And if we looked at AL toolbox, Doesn't seem to me that either of these should require anything to do with pillow, but maybe pandas requires pillow. I know holidays is a list of US holidays that definitely won't require an imaging library, which is what pillow is, but maybe pandas does because it can also do something with images. Hard to say. Anyway, it's just this little protection that DocAssemble has. That warning is saying it tried to update a package. If things are still working, it's fine. Um, and you notice it didn't give us an error. So I think it might uh, give us an error if they were literally incompatible package versions. That's what it should be if they're set up correctly with the dependencies. OK, that might have been more of a deep dive than we needed, but that's the basic way to do that. Um, if we get an error message from this, it can be really hard to find the error message. So something that I sometimes do just to save my reading is I go ahead and um, go to something like ChatGPT, or you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to try Claude for this, just to see how it does. And I just ask it to read it. It can really speed up a lot of the work that goes into trying to, to read through that really wordy log message. There's no reason you have to use Claude. You can use any of these AI tools. It can be helpful. And eventually it will load. There's no errors this time, so there's not really anything to say. But I found it can be really helpful to uh, to use it when you do have an error. And you're like, I can't figure out where the error is. All right, I didn't like that. It's too long for this free version of Claude. Um, it should work in something like ChatGPT, which has a much long, longer limit. But just a little tip there. I don't have to go in too far, much further with that. OK. Question from Matt here about how to understand email notifications. And we're talking about email notifications. This is the setting that we're talking about here. They're inside of DocAssemble. There's a configuration option that lets you get a message from the server by email anytime that there's an error that happens. It's one of the configuration options here. You can see there's a lot of things you can configure here. If you turn on any, if you add to error, the error notification email configuration option on your server and you put a list of emails or a single email, these folks will get a message every time an error is logged. Um, you can skip particular errors. That's a really helpful thing. What I've found is 
there were some errors I didn't really want to get notified about or that I was, they were happening repeatedly. I had investigated it. I couldn't resolve them, but I knew that those were kind of harmless errors. Um, you can explicitly say you don't want to get those. And then you may want to choose this option here to get the messages when you get the messages to see the actual um, answers that the user gave. That's one way to get a little bit more detailed information in your error messages. That, that can be helpful. I will say this is kind of a noisy channel because what happens if the server restarts, the person might run into an error. Um, not all of the errors that you're going to get notified about need to be acted on. It is a good idea to kind of monitor them for a while, start to figure out which ones actually indicate a real problem and which ones don't. And if they aren't causing a problem, try to stop getting notifications about them because it's not going to um, increase your security. You're going to be spending time tracking down errors that aren't actually problems. Another point, part of this question was, are there any logs or user variables that we can look at? I would say like, it's a really blunt interest instrument to get this error notification. It means something went wrong and that you can maybe add it to your queue of things to track down and look into. If you have the answers attached to your answer, to your e error notification email, something you could do. And I'm going to try not to show any configuration variables or anything like that on the screen, but I'm on our dev server. I can go to the AL dashboard here it's in this menu. If you have that installed, one of the Suffolk lab tools, I can go to view answer files. In the newest version of this tool, you're going to see a little bit more detail than I have here in this version I have installed. Need to update that. You'll see something like the username, but I think you could probably also get the user ID from that variable list. If not, let me see. I don't want to upgrade that now to, to show you. Maybe I'll come back to that later and show you what it looks like in the newest version. So we do show the username. Then you could try joining that session and just see, is there an error on the screen right now? If there's not, you can assume that it does not necessarily need a lot of your attention, but you might still want to track it and come back to it later if you had more time. Is that really satisfying? No. Um, system administration is all about getting lots of noisy information and figuring out what to spend time investigating. You can't drive yourself crazy by tracking down every log message, because a lot of the time they're not going to demand your attention. But if you see a change or a trend where there's a lot new of new messages and they're tied to an, a reported event by a user, the logs can be really helpful to narrow down where you need to investigate. And again, if you see a sudden change where there are a lot of new error messages, you can assume, even if you haven't gotten a report from a user, there's some kind of problem. So it's it's all data that's going to help you, but it's not um, something to obsess over the details of, in my experience. It's like being a intelligence agent and um, you're trying to sift through all of the different signals and clues without necessarily having the same reaction to each of those signals that might mean something is wrong. And also not missing the ones that are really important. It's, it's not a one size fit all response. Let's see. Other than that kind of being able to jump into the session, if you can figure out who the user is, you can go through some of the logs. And again, I'm gonna to try to not disclose any real data, but this is our dev server. So I think I should be fairly safe to do that. Just talk about one of the logs that are available here uh, on, in DocAssemble and what the different ones contain. 
the first place to look is just the, the built-in doc assemble log. And it should really repeat the same error messages that you see in your error notification email. The difference is it's going to have lots of kind of informational messages that aren't an email to you. So it might be harder to find the error in this list. But you could look at the, the what happened right before and right after the log message if you can find the exact time that, of that error. That can be helpful to troubleshoot and look at. Again, this is the main place that I look for those kind of errors. You probably already know this, but if you don't, if you're looking at this just as you're like earlier in your doc assemble journey, I don't think that applies to anyone on this call. Um, DocAssemble automatically rotates it, its log files uh, once they've reached a certain size. So if you don't see the message in docassemble.log, you can go down to dot one, two, three, and so on, with dot seven being the oldest one and the one that doesn't have a number at all being the newest one. If you wanted to see what these other log files do, access.log is purely from the web front end of DocAssemble. It's just going to tell you about requests that were made to the web front end. This is not a very smart layer of the system. It's just going to, it's the, in this case, DocAssemble uses the Nginx web server by default. It's just going to be basically what URL did the person request? Did we get a response or was there uh, an error message? Um, it's usually totally meaningless. There's almost nothing to, to learn from this log. On the other side of that, there's this error.log that is also tied to the web server, the Nginx web server. It's a really low level error that you're going to see here, which won't tell you very much about the application. We see a little bit here. This is saying there were some timeouts when certain requests were made. That might be useful information, but it probably just means the server was restarting when someone tried to make a request. So not much help there. Uh, I don't usually look at either of those logs. If you have a background action that's running, then I would look inside the worker.log. Worker.log contains information about background tasks. And I, almost every time this little message that happens regularly, I don't know quite the frequency this occurs, it erases the thing you want to see. So I almost always have to download this to see the rest of the lines because it's only showing the most recent 30 lines. And I often have to go back to an older worker log too because it gets rotated out pretty frequently. WebSockets, I suppose this is going to tell you something about some of the really kind of less used features of DocAssemble. WebSockets are used for the monitoring backend of DocAssemble. If you go to monitor, this uses WebSockets. If that's a feature you're using, I don't know anybody who is, then you might want to look in that log file to troubleshoot some things. The only other one that might be worth looking in regularly is this uwsgi.log. So I talked about how the Nginx web server layer is just like, what URL did the person request? Did we respond with information or not? That is, this is the actual more substantive web server. It runs the Python code of DocAssemble. It gets forwarded to Nginx to, to return like an HTML rendered version of stuff. Um, so this log can sometimes be helpful for certain low-level errors, and it can give you Python error messages that don't resolve, that are like too low of a level for DocAssemble errors to occur. But it's kind of noisy. Um, if your web server does not start up at all, this is a log that I look at, and I can do that on the server itself. Um, and let's go ahead and do that. This is a troubleshooting th thing you can do on the back end of the server. This is the way I normally do it. I type docker exec. See, I'm inside my server container right now. This is my Ubuntu server for our dev server. I do docker exec dash ti. I hit the tab key to autocomplete with the name of the only container I know is on this machine. 
And then I type the name of the interactive shell slash bin slash bash is the interactive shell inside the container. Then I can look at that log file. And those are underneath user share knock assemble. And if the server totally fails to start up, in that case, the UWSGI log is usually the place that has more information about why the doc assemble container couldn't start. So that, that is one that I do look at regularly. Let's take a look here. Anything else that we can say? Um, yeah, good point. If the user is anonymous, it's really hard to know which session to look in. The best thing you can do, I suppose, if we're using that dashboard command, which I have here somewhere, well, is to look at the date of the session. Okay, uh, I closed it. Go back there. So you did get the email at a particular time. We've kind of shortened it here to being just the day. Um, it's not a whole timestamp, but they are in chronological order. So you could maybe cross-reference the error with the session, the error time with the session, figure out, well, how far do we think they got before they ran into that error? You end up having to kind of be a little bit of a detective to interpret log messages. That can give you a clue for which one to look at. But I think the biggest, most important thing to keep in mind is if you can't find it um, by looking at a session, or if you do think you found the session and the session seems to work, there's probably not um, anything to do. And you just have to live with the fact that, yeah, an error happened somewhere, but I don't, I don't know where or why. <laughs> and just make a note of it. And once you've gotten enough data, then maybe you can act on it. And sometimes it's hard the first time you get the message. Big topic. Matt, did I hit enough of what you were asking with that question? Yes, that was really uh, helpful. I'm happy that I was doing a number of those things, uh, but this added additional uh, detail and context and gave me some more tools. Um, I think my biggest lesson is that I don't need to freak out every time I get one of those notifications and it can just be a data point. It can maybe lead to additional uh, troubleshooting or investigations, especially because I think almost all of these, I've only received the notifications from the server itself and not in conjunction with any user feedback. So again, this is me probably just freaking out too easily. Great. Okay. Good. I'm glad, glad, glad we're answering the right stuff for you there. I'm going to try to log into the AWS console. That's probably going to be helpful for a couple of these questions. And I'm going to pause my screen share to make sure I don't record anything confidential here. While I do that, you're going to see my screen frozen in where I last was, but I am trying to load. AWS right now. So Michelle had a question about CPU usage log alerts. And this is another place where you could set up logging. Um, if we go to light sale here, we're looking at pretty low level information about the server. It doesn't have any insight into what's happening at the doc assemble level of things. It can just say, it's like looking outside at a computer on, on the server rack, basically, right? It can see, is the disk spinning really hard? Is the CPU processing a lot of requests? Um, is it getting a lot of network traffic? I actually don't think all of those are visible by default inside Amazon LightSail. I think you really just get information about CPU usage. So here's how I got to that. I went to LightSail, I clicked on the name of the instance, and then I clicked on metrics. When I look at metrics, I can observe what the CPU usage was. Um, 
I want to start getting concerned about CPU usage. If you find the server is not responding, you might want to take a look at the CPU usage on the machine and see, is it really busy at doing something? Usually that means it either is doing something legitimate that takes a lot of CPU usage, processing a lot of records from the database, um, installing Python packages can use a lot of CPU usage. That's, I think, exactly what these little usage spikes are. It's when I updated a package on the server. You see it got up to 30% CPU usage about both times. That's from running the Python package installer. It's a really inefficient and slow installer, unfortunately. Um, but that's pretty normal. And if you ever get above the 60%, the server might stop responding and not answer you anymore with light sale. Because you're on a, sh a shared environment. It may not even let, it might not really let you get up to close to 100% usage. Okay. So if you wanted to add an alarm for that, you could. What I would recommend is taking a look at some amount of history, seeing where the spikes were. These spikes happen every day. So I, I know I'm going to want to set the alert threshold for something significantly higher than that. Maybe it looks like maybe 40% would be a fair threshold to get alerts for. Then I can add an alarm. You can set up certain kinds of alert thresholds. So if you care, if it's just like a little momentary spike, a blip, and then it disappears, you may not care about that. And you can configure all of those options. And it looks like already it's averaging at over five minutes. And then you can set yourself up to get an alert when that happens. So uh, this is what I would do. I'd recommend setting it to a threshold that's maybe double what you see the normal amount is, because every once in a while you're going to get something abnormal, right? Keeping in mind, 60% is when you start to have trouble. Um, and maybe this gives you a little early warning into what's happening. So that's totally fine to get that kind of alert. Just keep in mind, this is really limited what it's alerting you of. Um, it's the tool you have, so you can use it for sure. But it's just going to tell you basically when the server is really busy and doing something. Is that good or bad? You don't know until you look closer. Once you start to get around 60%, though, you might find the server is about to crash. Do you want to know when it's getting close to crashing? Um, maybe you do, so you can kind of observe trends over time. Um, but probably another way to get alerts is if the server actually does go offline, you can use an other um, alerting service. For a long time, I was recommending a tool called Uptime Robot, which still exists. We were kind of grandfathered into a free tier of it. Now it's kind of expensive for what it offers. But you can, um, I mean, it still says there's certain free tier, but I, I don't think the free tier covers very much anymore. I think one thing you can't do, for example, is have multiple people get alerts about the same server in one account. Uh, that's, I think, a feature they took away. So maybe it's still a fine one to recommend. Um, we also use a couple other systems that do that. We use one called Hoodoo, which is for IT management that has built-in alerting when a service goes offline. You could use something like Microsoft System Center Operations Manager to get your alerts. Whatever it is, at that point, once the server stops responding to requests, you know there's a problem. That's where we've tuned our um, alerting for now, given our capacity and, and what the, the stakes are for us if the, the service goes offline. We may need to invest in more um, proactive monitoring when we're handling more servers at once. Um, but at that point, once the server goes offline, we can start to tune, understand whether there's a trend. We still have this two weeks of data stored here, right? So we can, we can do that. It, it is possible to set up more sophisticated monitoring in LightSail. I, I do know that, but I don't know where that is. I don't think it's going to be through the LightSail console. I think you have to go back into the more advanced Amazon Web Services console. That's kind of where that is. Did that... I think, Michelle, your question was really just remembering someone else asked the question. Anything 
else that's raised for folks? Anything you wanted to add to that question, Michelle, or anybody else who's interested in alerting about CPU usage? All right, well, that's the big picture. Lots you can do with alerting. Part of the same idea, like logging data is kind of noisy. You're just absorbing a stream of data and you have to figure out what actually is relevant. Not every You don't want to get alerts about things you're not going to act on. You might want to store that to look at later if you notice a problem that you did want to get alerted about, but you don't want to just get a bunch of messages that you're going to then ignore because it becomes the good boy who cried wolf. And then you just want to get alerts about things that are actually actionable, if possible. But it's constantly a, a battle fine-tuning your alert threshold until you get as few as seem relevant. And you're going to have to maybe swing back and adjust it the other way. Uh, we're just trying to do as well as we can, given the amount of uh, data that comes into us. All right. I do see some message on the chat, but Sam, I'm hope I'm assuming you'll you'll pull them out if anything needs to be answered live. Okay. Let's see. So yeah, Amanda asked a question here about um, and I, I know this because I've I've helped uh, Amanda with this problem a couple of times when she upgrades the Docker container which is a process where you can go in the back end here, like I, I'm here in this window here, and you do a new Docker run command, right? That's what we're talking about, upgrading the container from the back end. What's happened to, in, in her system a couple of times is it did not restore the proper backup from S3. What are we talking about? We say that. All right. Assuming you followed our instructions for setting up your Doc Assemble server, you have an area in S3 that has the same name probably as your production server, where all of the files are stored that are served to the end user, as well as the configuration file is stored there and a, a nightly backup. When you do an upgrade of your Doc Assemble container and you were using S3, when you shut down the old container, it makes a backup of the current contents of your database, the configuration, all of those things. Those all get sent to S3. And those files live in the root of your S3 bucket. So we have two that are the most important. We have this redis.rtv. And then inside the Postgres folder here, not really in the root, actually, it's its own folder. You have this doc assemble file. This is the doc assemble database, which stores the usernames, passwords, a hash version of the password. It doesn't store it in plain text, um, but it's the it's basically what allows you to log in and tracks the sessions, all the answers people gave during their, the uses of the interviews. Those are all stored in this file. And in the, the Redis file has somewhat similar information. The Redis is an in-memory database, so it's just stuff that has to be available faster. Um, but it's basically the same kind of runtime information about the DocAssemble interview. It just is in a faster database that lives in the memory instead of living on the disk. Before I do a upgrade, I like to download this Redis file, the Postgres folder, the, the files that are in there, as well as the config.yml file. And I'm not going to open up that one because it has some of our, our secrets in it, our API keys. Um, once the server is turned offline, right? When I've done a Docker stop, And I've made sure to give it enough time to finish stopping. So I'm going to put the, the T command, to giving it 600 seconds. That's 10 minutes, Should is usually enough. And then I look at those files and I say, OK, yeah, they're not like zero kilobytes. They're probably actually the real data. What does that mean? It's hard to know until you've given it a try. Um, 
it looks like it's backed up stuff. So that's always great to, to have that um, first signal. Like, does it look like around the size of what a database should be? Ours has been used for a while. Um, if you have a pretty low usage server, it might not even be as much as 100 megabytes. This is our development server. So it's just like, it's not the whole world using it. It's just people who we've been given access to with Suffolk. Um, on our production server, I think it, it's going to be a lot larger than that. And then another thing I would do potentially is just go through and look at the backup folders. Make sure there are backups for every night. It usually, I think, is configured to do two weeks of backups. And then I'm going to look for the, the Redis file there, the Postgres file there. Are those the right size? Those look similar to the size, maybe a little smaller than the most recent backup that I see. So that's really kind of all that we can do. We can just download those backups and have them ready to go if something goes wrong with the upgrade. As far as why, when you start the server back up, those backups were not good. I don't have a good answer. There's not an easy way to load this file. It's a binary file. Um, there's not an easy way to open it on your local server and on your local computer and confirm it has the data you think it should have. Kind of the best way is just to save a copy of those files, maybe a couple of days, the backups locally on your computer. Do the upgrade without erasing anything on the old server, but just have those, those uh, downloaded, ready to go, and be ready to replace them with one of the backups that looks like it should work. It's not very satisfying. It's kind of the best that I have right now for this. It could be nice if DocAssemble had some more features around like validating the backups. Those just aren't there right now, and there's not an easy way to let you see what those files have and visually inspect them before you do the upgrade. I guarantee you, if you don't back them up locally, something will go wrong and look at erased. So it's just Murphy's law. It's good to just have that precaution. Yeah, Emily. Just to just to make sure I understand the timing of what you just said. So so you said like you would first stop the Docker, and then is when you're uh, making copies of these files. Right. So it does it two times. Well. Every night at 6 a.m., there's a backup created here in the backup folder. These files here, the Postgres and the Redis RDB, those two are created when you stop the container. So, well, I guess it says 6.30 a.m. UTC. Yeah. Um, so maybe this is the nightly backup one from the most recent one doesn't get put into a backup folder. But anyway, if you want to get another backup from the current data in your server, you have to stop the container. That's going to force it to do another backup. Thanks. No point in downloading it before you've done that um, to get the most recent stuff. So, yep, could we get some better stuff in Docker symbol for that? Possibly. Maybe actually, even if um, Jonathan's not interested in that, maybe we can build out some features with some more developer support at Suffolk to help troubleshoot that and avoid this issue. I will say I've had some problems like this with one server where every time I've upgraded it, I have some trouble. And in other servers that were created around the same time, I don't have that trouble. So I don't know what that means, except sometimes maybe if it happens to you repeatedly, you could consider rebuilding from scratch. That may not work for everybody, but something to consider. best practices for upgrading stuff. Um, there is a philosophy called development operations, DevOps, and then continuous integration, where people say you should almost always be on the leading edge with everything. I'm starting to come around to more of that idea. Um, the reason is if you're a version behind routinely, if your test server does not match the latest code that you have available on GitHub, you are going to eventually run into a problem 
that's not caused by not like cautiously testing stuff um, that's going to be really hard to roll back from. So in development operations, like people who really believe in this say, just deploy early and often and always and, and be practiced and ready to roll back bad rollouts of stuff. I think that makes sense. So I would say in general, your best practice is to deploy the latest version regularly. Um, that does not mean that you should be like updating it every day. You can figure out your own cadence for it. Maybe if you did it once a month on a time where you're like, okay, I have a process for, for downgrading if I need to, you can do that. So what would you do? If you go to package management, And you click the update button next to one of our packages, like the assembly line package. It has a version number here. Let's say I wanted to run 2.27 instead of 2.28, because I tried deploying it to the latest version, following this like deploy early, deploy often strategy. And I didn't like that version. It was broken in some way. All of our packages are not just on GitHub. They're also on the Python package index, PyPI. So that means if you go to this PyPI line here, I could put that package in. This is the syntax for it. Two equal signs for a very specific version we want to run. And I just put the version number in that I like. So that's how you would downgrade it. Downgrading should take two minutes. So. Um, it's something that you should be able to feel confident upgrading and then being ready to downgrade for that reason. Um, trying to like say, okay, I'm always going to be six months behind. It's going to be a real burdensome on you. And then you won't be ready to um, to downgrade. It's better to be ready to, to go back in time. This can also happen with your own code that's not on PyPI because we put our stuff there, but maybe you didn't put your stuff there. How would you go ahead and downgrade? Uh, a package that was made by one of your developers. There's actually only one way. If I go to a package here from GitHub, I can choose the branch. There's no way to say what particular commit point in time in history I want to install. So what you need to do is to create a branch from a particular commit. Every time I do this, I just Google <laughs> GitHub make branch from commit. So that's what you'll do. You'll you'll figure out how to make a, a commit into a branch. And then you're going to have to install that branch from the package management page. So that's the rollback strategy. Um, I think a good cadence for updating these things is about once a month. So choose a time that works for you. You don't forget it. Um, inside of this philosophy of continuous integration is that not only should you routinely deploy the latest version of stuff, you should also automate that deployment and better automate the rollback process. So I love something like this on our roadmap to make it easier for you. I will say we do have this action that I was working on a while ago that when you install when you merge a commit to main, it would automatically install on a dedicated server of your choice. So you could set up uh, this action on your server to install um, the package when you merge to main. Automating that is going to maybe like help you keep things in sync and up to date. And I think it's a good idea. But this isn't actually, I still needed to do some more testing on this before I deployed it for people to use. Quentin, on the on the sub on the subject yeah. of backups, we there are a couple of related questions that may be worth um, addressing. Sure. Um, Michelle was asking about sort of backup strategy. Should you manually make multiple backups before uh, just before you update to make sure that you get at least one full backup? Um, and in the questions that we got previously, Matt had asked a couple about backup strategy, you know, versioning versus daily backups, and uh, whether to back them up to other platforms, things like that. Um, yeah, good questions. Um, okay, so let's see. 
backups, I think I covered the backups that I would take, which is before I did a server upgrade, I would download the, from this backup folder some points in time that uh, there is one time when I upgraded a server and then it didn't finish its process and it erased everything in S3. That has only happened to me once, but it was very concerning. I really wish that I had downloaded a couple of days of the backup. So doing that is a good idea. I wish you didn't have to do it manually. I, we don't have an automated way to do it right now, but I think I covered that already. Um, in terms of turning on versioning, I'll show people where this op option exists. We go to our bucket and then go to properties, I believe. There's a bucket versioning option you can turn on. Um, bucket versioning is not a backup system. It, it is used to help protect you from malicious actions. Um, so it is not a bad precaution to have turned on. Uh, I guess it could also help in that scenario where, where I had accidentally, somehow something that Doc Assemble did erased the history in S3, it would also protect me from that. So it's not a bad thing to have turned on. Um, it's not gonna be very expensive because it's, differ it's differential. It's gonna automatically store the difference between each point in time history. And um, it's a good extra safety thing. That, let me see, were there other backup questions that I didn't quite cover? Oh, should you automatically maybe update, back up those to another AWS region? It depends how mission critical your server is. So for our production environment in Massachusetts, and I'm not saying this is the same as the guarantee that we would offer to other folks, we might offer a higher guarantee depending on what they needed for the right, basically whatever the right price point is where we have the management ability to do that. Um, we would uh, consider our DACA sample server to not be like the sessions people have made on there. We don't offer a guarantee that they're available forever. So um, could you back up those files onto another region? Yes, you could also back them up onto a, something outside of AWS. You probably could set that up in a way that's relatively automatable. I have never done that. Um, and I feel good about the level of protection that we have for our needs there. So it will add extra protection. If Amazon goes down and you want to restore into a totally other service, and if you need that availability, then that would add, add extra protection for you, for sure. Just at a high cost, probably, both in terms of your time, complexity of the system, more than the monetary cost, to be honest. And I think that Caroline, I think this question Michelle answered on our Teams channel. It was about an, a bug in an old version of Kiln. Oh, we covered a bunch of stuff. We're kind of down into the miscellaneous ideas. Yeah, I think you managed to get almost everything on the list. <laughs> We've right. only got five minutes left, so uh, gauge what you think you can cover to that time, I guess. Well, yeah, anything coming in on the chat that I should, without reading all the messages that I should cover? No, nope, we got a couple of follow-ups, but um, uh, I think the ones Caroline had asked, is it difficult to roll back doc assemble versions? Um, but then she said, never mind. So I think you must've been covering that at the same time she was asking that. Okay, um, yeah. If you, I can I can actually cover it. Like, so this version, we're talking about this version of doc assemble right? Like the, the system version of Doc Assemble. Uh, yeah, it's really hard to do. Um, the only way to do it is to build the Doc Assemble container from source. Um, you need to go onto your server, download the source via GitHub. Then you have to compile it yourself, which takes a while to do. So that is, I guess, not really easily reversible. But I've never had that need. I would say so if there's a, a, a bug that stops you from using a particular version of DocAssemble, I have never found that it wasn't fixed within a few hours of letting Jonathan know about it. Um, and 
the cost or risk there is that you're offline for a couple of hours to build from source because that's very doable, very predictably doable. It just takes a while. Yeah. I believe that there's some instructions on the documentation page about that. And, and uh, some other uh, software let you roll back to a particular version because it has multiple versions on Docker Hub, which is where the Docker image is stored. Docker symbol doesn't do that. So you don't have that option. I think it's going to be here. Downgrading. Yeah, it's right there in the documentation we need to do. So this just takes a while to do. I I think it might take like a, a, more than an hour. Depends on how fast your server is that you're compiling everything on. But the steps are right there, so you can always follow them. One other thing that you might find is this will not work on the same container that already was running a version of Doc Assemble. So in LightSail, assuming you're using LightSail, you might want to make a whole new container to do this process in. An instance. They call it an instance, not a container. So, okay. So you, you might want to make a new instance to do the, the new install from scratch with. So just something to consider. Um, one thing is you never want two servers to both be pointing to the same S3 bucket at the same time. Because when one shuts down, it'll overwrite the data that the other one's going to be interacting with. So you, you never want to run the same S3 bucket at the same time. So if you do this process of downgrading to an old version of DocAssemble, make sure to stop the old container. Maybe even, I guess you could consider making a new S3 bucket too, to store the, the, the files in. And maybe co manually copying over the data that's going to be the same. So um, that's, there's more I could say there about safety. You Again, if you're looking at S3, you want to look in the config.yml and make sure that is not pointing to the old S3 environment because it will download the file from S3. And then it will run with whatever was on S3, which might point to a totally different S3 location. You don't want, you want to be careful for that kind of thing, making sure the configuration reflects what you're running. That's a real like nuanced thing there. So hopefully I'm not going to to the leads with that. Well, I think that's about all the time we have. So thanks y'all for coming. And um, if you're watching this on YouTube, make sure to visit Suffolk Lit Lab, SuffolkLitLab.org for more information about us. And uh, yeah, we'll see you guys the first Wednesday of next month. All right, I'll put that on. <laughs>